join welcome to this important debate on whether capitalism has lost its compass, and I would even say moral compass. This is the first time Russia has hosted the APEC uh, summit. It's an organization representing big and small, rich and poor countries from the Asia-Pacific area. More than 20 world leaders are attending this annual event, including presidents from Russia and China, the U.S. Secretary of State was just here, and prime ministers of Australia and New Zealand. Also here in Vladivostok, in Russia's Far East, is nearly 1,000 business, business executives and entrepreneurs to discuss the important economic, financial, and corporate issues facing this region and the world. And perhaps no issue is bigger than the current state of the global economy and whether capitalism has lost its compass, its moral compass. Let's keep the moral element here. I think we all can count. So that's what we're debating, and I have a great panel right here with me. Arguing that capitalism has lost its compass, Chen Renner, he's the former uh, CEO of the Global Institute for Tomorrow, and he's author of Consumptionomics, Asia's Role in Reshaping Capitalism and Saving the Planet. Next, we have Frank Jürgen Richter, he's a German entrepreneur and chairman of the Horasis Group, a, a Zurich-based international organization. On the other side of the coin, Capitalism is just doing fine, at least as an idea. Jim Rogers, at the end, a known distinguished international investor and author of A Gift to My Children. I'd like you to explain the title of that book. And we also have Artem Volinitz. He is the uh, uh, N Plus Group uh, CEO in one of Russia's largest diversified industrial con conglomerates. So please welcome our panel right there. I'd like to take a poll here, and I want you to be honest, and I, don't, I really don't want people to stand in the middle. Raise your hand if you think capitalism has lost its compass. Raise your hand if you think it's lost its compass. Okay, does that automatically mean all the rest of you think it hasn't? Raise your hand if it hasn't lost its compass. Okay, Jim, I, I'm sure you <laughs> bought these people off. Okay. Okay. It's not scientific, but it looked like 80% believe that it's still on track, and 20% of you don't believe it, that capitalism has lost its compass. So, Jim, you say it hasn't. Why? Well, capitalism is so far the best economic system which has been developed. It has many, many flaws. There's no question about that. But everything else is even worse, everything else that mankind has ever tried. The problem, Peter, in the last few years is not so much uh, capitalism, at least in the West. In the West, the governments have gotten in the way and the governments refuse to let people go bankrupt. So we don't, now, have, we don't have pure capitalism, that's your problem, right? We, don't have, we certainly don't have capitalism. We have the government meddling. Now capitalism without bankruptcy is like Christianity without hell. They've got to let people go bankrupt and the government keeps bailing out its friends. What happens, Peter? Chandran, Wait a minute, Peter. Jump in. What happens Let's is go. the government this is a debate. Chandran, up the jump government in. and they bail them out. Jim, Chen. Well, I live in Hong Kong, so please do, do not confuse me as being anti-capitalist. And I think this is the important part of this conversation. Uh, I pay some of the highest rents in the world. But the, the discussion not, shouldn't, shouldn't be, I think, the Cold War discussion of, you know, you're capitalist, you're anti-capitalist. I think that's probably a lazy way to have the discussion. And from an Asian, Pacific, for a, from an Asian perspective, my, my view will be that capitalism may be the best thing we've invented so far. But we'd be suggesting by the end of history if we think it's the only form. So the point I would like to finish off by saying is the fatal flaw of capitalism when we can talk about the banks and hedge funds and stuff like that is that it's absolutely reliant on promoting relentless consumption through externalizing costs. I'll finish by saying, because you've only given me about 90 minutes, to imagine that in 2050, 5.5 or 6 billion Asians can aspire and live like Americans is the height of irresponsibility. This is simply not possible. But this is not an environmental discussion. It's a discussion about how, therefore, do we create prosperity that delivers on the social dimension, which is fundamental to creating any form of capitalism. But my, my main point is Asians should not aspire to replicate the exceptionalism of American capitalism. OK, let's talk about an emerging one. Artem, what do you think? I mean, is capitalism people-friendly? I mean, there, what, there are 23 million people unemployed in the United States? In, in Spain alone, 
young people 50 percent? I mean, how do you sell capitalism these days? Well, I don't understand what capitalism has to do with uh, social responsibility, to be honest. They're divorced. They, this is a completely different thing. The fundamental nature of capitalism is individualism, egoism, greed. Uh, All the good things of our nature. The stuff you want All to... All of our good nature. The reason you want to get ahead in life, once you get ahead, perhaps like Jim, you can leave something for your children and think about the good things you can do with wealth uh, one created. But this is the checks and balances uh, which are now uh, maybe more established in places like United States, which, uh, uh, but uh, in less established in places like Russia. But the wealth creation and creation of businesses which can care for those consumers, and consumption is good because it can create businesses that will take care of those consumers. Uh, fundamentally, we're talking about the way to develop uh, the world, develop to develop the free enterprise, uh, and focus on individuals. It is not surprising, by the way, that the vice president, potential vice president, the candidate uh, for Republican nomination is a keen reader of Ayn Rand, right? Ayn Rand, because this is, this is the center of, uh, um, of, of what America used to be 70 years what ago. What it used to be. Okay, Frank, jump in. Capitalism definitely lost its compass, Peter, and um, I would say capitalism is here to stay, but we have to tame capitalism. I'm European, as you know, I'm based in Zurich, and when I come here to Asia, I feel a bit like an outsider. A lot of, actually, Europe bashing going on. Actually, you are bashing us, and, and why? I think there are two um, kind of schools why this Europe bashing is going on. I thought there's and a lot of bashing of Asia by Europeans. Same thing, and we shouldn't bash anymore. But there are two well, schools it, it, of well, thinking. Europe and the United States should stop, uh, stop lecturing the world as well. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you're right. We lectured all the time. But you know, and, and please, uh, uh, my, my, my language maybe might be bad, but some people say we are bloody capitalist. Our banks are destroying our financial systems, a lot of it's greed true. in the system. But there's another school of thinking. People say we are not capitalist anymore. Maybe your school of thinking, Jim, we are all socialist or even Marxist. You know, in Europe, usually we only work 35 hours per week. We have seven weeks of vacation. Well, maybe you're complacent. We are complacent. We enjoy life, of course. We like to um, go to our mountains and lakes. And uh, what we really have to do is to um, reposition capitalism. We have to preserve capitalism, but we have to get rid of the short-term profit-taking. We have to recreate the link between the social thing, the public, and the capitalist. Short-termer? Well, I agree. Short-termer? Go ahead. People, should, people who fail should be allowed to fail and go bankrupt. What's happened now in the West, every time somebody gets in trouble, they call up the government and say, bail me out, save me, save me. But they and did the that to the bank. Them out. They Jim, won't let them Jim they did that to the banks. They did that they didn't they do did that people. to the banks, the what insurance did they do companies, the, the automobile. I mean, what Carl about Marx, mortgages? Carl should Marx Greece go bankrupt? Probably, what do you think? Should Greece go bankrupt? Can I, can I say why in the United States the government bails out the, the banks, for instance? And it's but it wasn't the, just the banks. The banks, no, insurance the, companies, the automobiles. Well, they got bailed out yeah, first, Chandran. I'll, I'll, keep going. I'll, I'll, keep going. I'll tell you why, I think. Um, first, you've got, you have to promote relentless consumption. That's not a socialist agenda, but you have to. To promote relentless consumption, you have to do two things. You have to constantly underprice resources and underprice externalities. When you do that, you have to do something else. You have to fight any attempt at regulation. This has become the mantra of business, fight regulation. This is not that healthy, though bad regulation is no good. I accept that. When you eventually get to a state where <coughs> business interests are rooted in undermining regulation, then you have something else that happens. You begin to have business interests usurping the state. Okay. When they usurp the state, it's a good the point. That's a very good. Where is the state? Tom, where is the state playing all this? Where is the state? It because shouldn't be a lot of people will say, a lot of people will say that the big capitalists, and that's what I'm going to call them, have captured the state. The state is in the wrong place. It shouldn't be where it is because the, currently in Europe, the problem is not with, uh, with with underlying companies. The problem is a bunch of government officials who couldn't agree on a single thing. Right? I completely agree with Jim. Let state not meddle into the affairs, and consumption, by the way, is good because it's other side of supply and demand equation. You need to have demand to create supply. In order to create supply, you create companies that produce products that people will consume. And let the state not meddle. I'm Jim, Adam, do you know anybody who didn't want a, a better standard of living for themselves, for their children and grandchildren? Do you know any human being in history that has to, said, I, I want to live I better? Think, I think that's a false question. Of course, I don't know anyone who knows that. But is entitlement 
to, you know, free, free mortgages to buy another house, uh, a better standard of living? That's not, that's not the point I'm talking about. I, I agree. They should I not think, be free I mean, mortgages. I think we constantly use these cliché terms, I'm sorry, to suggest that anyone who says that there must be limits, and I'm only going to talk about the Asian Pacific region, there is no way five billion people can live like Americans. So we're going to have to think about it very differently. One billion Asians getting richer has already rocked the world. Another billion will do amazing things too. So you're it saying... It would disenfranchise the, the majority. I am saying if you want to address the poverty issue and create social stability, we are going to need to price things differently. So you're saying that if one billion Asians should always be poor because you said they should be poor. No, Jim, you are... You're, I hate to say it, you're oversimplifying. You just got through saying no. one billion Asians cannot right. improve no. their no. 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 point is, all started. poverty is not the issue. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, on this side of the panel. No, that's, that's not the definition of capitalism. I want a definition from a wise man. What is capitalism? Well, if you go, you go what you is to happening? China. Okay. I think, you know, we need entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs create wealth, and uh, entrepreneurs are the heart of capitalism, making money, right? And I think we don't need less capitalists, but more capitalists. In the ideal world, everybody should be a capitalist, not depending on the state. But unfortunately, we are not living in the ideal world. So I think capitalists should give back to society. They should pay taxes to start So you're us. a very traditional... I'm you're extremely imposing again, I'm proud see, about that. You're trying to impose things on poor entrepreneurs are trying to make money and wealth. You're, starting, you're now telling them what they should be doing instead of allowing them to do what they do best, which create companies, jobs, wealth, etc. Okay, as long as can you I, leave more and more people behind. Let's always keep the moral compass here. Oh, Shannon, can go I, ahead. Can I answer your question very briefly? Again, I will try and answer it by saying this is not about whether we have a new definition of capitalism. The definition from a Chinese point of view, I would say 1.2 billion people in China cannot have access and dream of having a car. You and I know that. I go to China Completely a lot. disagree, the point sorry. Is, the point is, sorry, the definition of capitalism therefore will be how do you provide access to the most basic needs of people, which is food, water, housing, public health and education. All right, we have another question. The question is, what's the alternative? If we're, if we're saying capitalism has lost its compass, what's Frank, the alternative? Uh, Frank first, go ahead. Because Again, a traditional view, uh, it's social capitalism, right? So we have to give back to society. Actually, we are in the same camp, Chandran, but I think I disagree in one thing. The Chinese should own their cars. They can't. That's no, the they, they should. They because, can't. you know, we can't, can't be arrogant. We can't be arrogant like that saying we India. Europeans, we own cars, we Americans, we Russians own cars, but uh, the Chinese shouldn't. But you live right. in an underpopulated continent. Another question here, over here. A very quick question. Uh, how do. Can you give us your name? Yes, uh, John, John Keogh. Um, how do capitalists balance the, the confrontations with uh, corruption? Good, short question, good one. Jim. Everybody has corruption, whether you're Christians, Buddhists, socialists, communists, everybody has corruption. Now, yes, they should all go to jail, you ask me. They should, lots of people in, in Wall Street and in the banking industry should be in jail right now. The president of the New York Stock Exchange should be in jail right now. But there are lots of... Cool, I'd cop for that too, yeah. <laughs> But Do we have a, a young lady listen, up here? If you can figure out a way Come to on, Jimmy, eliminate corruption, We have a beautiful Russian be a woman, saint. I think. She wants to ask, ask a question. Go ahead. When we look at capitalism, here we're discussing a very traditional model of capitalism, whereby the company is responsible for its shareholders. Now, in the current world, companies are not just responsible for their shareholders. We have the concept of corporate social responsibility. Should we change to a mode of capitalism that is reliant on the corporate contract, where a company is responsible for all stakeholders involved, and thus would be sustainable? Jen. I mean, I've, I've done 20 years of work with some of the biggest companies in the world in corporate social responsibility. It's all very good, but much of it is flimsy. It doesn't really deal with the core issue that I've talked about, that essentially companies need to produce more. To produce more, they will need to use resources, externalize costs, etc. Much of corporate social responsibility has become a PR exercise in flimsy arguments. So I don't think that's really the reshaping of capitalism. On this side of the panel? Well, I was just going to say, yes, that's wonderful, everything you just said. And most corporations to stay in business have to satisfy everybody. But in the end, somebody has to pay for this. The main problem with socialism is, the main problem with socialism is, hang on one second, as someone else said, the problem with socialism, you eventually run out of other people's money. Somebody has to pay for this. Okay, yeah, the, the taxpayer will pay for it, okay? The taxpayer, but the taxpayer... We got a question right here, we're going to go to the break soon. Real um, my, name is Dennis right there. my name is Dennis Kostya and I'm from Voices of the Future Russia. My question is, um, I assume you're familiar with Greg Smith's resignation letter to New York Times from Goldman Sachs. And in the letter he briefly describes that money is more important that, than clients in the bank business. And do you, do you think that that's the case with capitalism in America and other parts of the world, that people put money ahead of um, the consumer? Uh, this is, sorry, this is the case of the failed model of the investment banking. Because if they wanted more money, they would take care of their clients. First. Yes. Gents, I think we have to move Frank, from... Um, I think we need to move away about from investment banks. I agree. I mean, that's just one element. The, the discussion we should be having is, how do we reshape so capitalism to fulfill 
the needs of a constrained planet, not an environmental discussion, where the greatest proportion of that population are going to be living in the Asia Pacific. My argument is the current method of externalizing costs reduce and pricing things down will not deliver on that prosperity which we want to share. It's not about CSR, it's not about the investment banks. It's a much wider political question, how do we deliver that? And that is the discussion because it's a political discussion. Uh, Vasily Sidorov, a Moscow-based entrepreneur. Uh, are we not confusing, uh, uh, confused in terminology? Uh, it, actually, capitalism is an in, in economic system based on private ownership of means of production. Uh, and uh, what you're referring to is really is our matters of spirituality and uh, morality. Uh, why are we burdening an economic system uh, with, uh, these, uh, li with this liability? Should it not be the other side of, of life and social uh, activity that should be taking care of, the, uh, of spirituality and morality or whatever? Economic, capitalism, I, I have to agree with Jim, is the best system there is for uh, what it should be, which is an economic system. It, it, it's it's a, a system of how... Well, my argument is purely economics argument about externalizing costs. I was not talking about morality or religion at all. And, and this is the problem. The moment you talk about something against the status quo, then you must be a hippie, you must be some angry person, or you don't understand. Or you must be, you know, on a higher moral ground. No, it's, it's not about morality, it's about pricing. Capitalism, as it strives, stands today, thrives on underpricing. My argument for Asia is we need to reject this, we'll need to reshape it. If a compass is to be found for capitalism, it will have to be made in Asia. That's a good point. Jim, you but want to jump I, in I before I want to say, Shannon, it's clear you don't understand. You're right. You don't understand. How are you going to prevent one billion Asians from having a better standard? Who's going to decide? No, what is a better you? standard of living, Jim? Tell me. Well, most people want electricity. They want soap. And they I'm want not against that. Water. Did I say I'm against that? But what I don't think. No, I'm saying, but a better standard of living is not car ownership. You and I live in Asia. Most Asian cities need more cars like but I the trust that most Asians, sorry for interrupting, would we'll disagree with you. They want cars, they want ownership. They if want you, it, but they if can't you, have it. If but you said they can't have it. No, no, I'm not saying <laughs> that. I'm not saying it. I'm saying the reality will be they can't. You go to yes, Beijing, they can. you know, they can't. Of course they can. Yes, they can. Look, suppose... Listen, if, if, we, we can't decide for them, right? Peter, These are individuals who are consumers. It may you know, be, talk about morality. We have to talk about morality. It may be that Americans won't have four cars each. But the Asians will have well, more no, I cars. Think the Americans will have Eventually, everyone fewer. in the world will have a car but the Americans if they continue down the path they are now. Frank? We have to talk about morality. I think I like the idea of our Australian friend. We have to move from shareholder value to stakeholder value, including everybody. Today, actually, President Calderon talked about principles. Uh, and he talked about principles in a governmental context. But we need also principles in the realm of entrepreneurship, capitalism, and if we stick to principles. If you go today to Washington DC or to Brussels, we feel, I feel there's a lot of corruption actually. We call it corporate advocacy or lobbying. And, I call um, it a hole in your pocket. Okay. Maybe. There's a certain void uh, over there. So I think principles are extremely important. But Morality. this is what happens if you try to regulate big businesses, small businesses, any business, you install a lot of uh, things on top of them which try to extract money. Uh, in a way which is, which is not uh, uh, in the market system. Let the businesses work, let them pay taxes, and let the government distribute the money to whoever unprivileged citizens there. No, but the state is fundamental to making the rules, otherwise we have chaos. I mean, let's take car ownership, and I'll bang on about cars. The roads are not made by the car companies, it's made by the state. I mean, law and order is not done by McDonald's, All right. it's done by the state. All right, well, I need to change gears here, okay? I think that we, we finesse this, what is wrong with capitalism.